Hi guys, and welcome back to classification part two. So in this section, this is where we ended last, talking about confusion matrices and how we can use those to calculate statistics that tell us about our model performance. So let's look at those statistics now. First, there's accuracy. Accuracy is a measure of true positives plus true negatives. That's when you get them all right, divided by the total. So just like in taking a test, accuracy is the number of ones that are correct divided by the total. So it's the overall proportion correct prediction in the model. Compare that to instead precision. Precision is a measure of true positives divided by the total number of things marked positive. So it's sometimes called positive predictive value. So how useful it is when something predicts it to be there, to be that label, how accurate that's, that is. So it's the number of times you were right when you guessed that it was positive. So it's true positives divided by the total number of positives or true positives plus false positives. Recall is sometimes called sensitivity. It's the number of true positives that were actually captured. So when you guess true positive, how many of those did you get right, including the misses? So, it's true positive divided by true positive plus false negatives, where you missed it. So the two difference comparisons here, we're talking about true positives divided by the total number of positives that you guessed versus true positives divided by the total number of real positives, even if you missed it. Okay. And so those two things together tell you something interesting about predictive value. Okay. First one tells me about how many, like if I guess true positive, how likely that is to be accurate. The second one tells me how likely my true positive guess is to not have missed something. Now F1 score was introduced, excuse me, it's decided it's winter here. So of course I'll, I'll on the nose run in action. But the F1 score is a harmonic mean of the precision and recall scores because sometimes people didn't like having two of these numbers. So let's collapse it into one number. And that's two times precision times recall divided by precision plus recall. It's not really a straight average of the two because they have different denominators. Technically they have the same numerator, but different denominators. So it's a harmonic mean. Now back to this general uh, processing pipeline that we looked at before. And so we're gonna now actually do this. So first import the packages for your chosen algorithm, create a blank model, fit the data to the model using training data, predict the categories from the model to the testing data and calculate model performance. So this is a really good summary of the steps normally used in machine learning. Where first thing you do is just gotta load everything, right? Create a blank model, this is Python, fit the data to the model on training data, test the, data, the model's accuracy on testing data and um, see what happens. Okay, so we're going back to this picture that we showed in the first lecture to try to see if we can uh, run through this pipeline. Okay. So we're gonna start with a bag of words method. And if I can make text a little bigger here. So a bag of words method is where we create um, the term by document matrix that we talked about in the last video, uh, where each cell in that term by document matrix is the number of times that that word occurred in that document. So you can use a one hot matrix, but we're instead going to keep all the information we have and use a straight conditional frequency table. Okay. So the count vectorizer function in scikit-learn is a bag of words converter basically that helps take our process text and transform it into this term by document matrix. So we load, first load, our count vectorizer. And we could also use cross-validation. This is from uh, an example from a book. Uh, and I took out the cross-validation part. So this just, by the way, is how you, the function you can use for cross-validation. So load the things you need. Then next, build a blank model. Well, in this case, the model is a count vectorizer. We're doing binary equals false because we don't want to do a one-hot encoding. Instead, we want to do 
a um, full coding of the data frame. So we have the actual count of the number of times that word appeared in the cell versus one hot. The min DF here is the minimum proportion of times it has to occur to be included. So we want to keep all of our words. You could here decrease, increase this value so that only words that are used more frequently occur. So you can kind of cut out very low frequency words. In this case, I'm just going to make it zero to include all words. Then we have a max DF value, which is the maximum proportion of time a word can occur for you to include it. If you set this to one, all words will be included. If you want to cut out very high frequent words, you can lower this number. If you have a bad byte, which is essentially an encoding error usually, um, you can uh, tell the count vectorizer to simply replace the um, encoding error. Now, we are going to take our count vectorizer we just built and fit it to our training corpus. Okay. The training corpus, since this has been a week since we've talked about it, Oh, gosh, it has um, the like randomly selected data sets from the uh, 20 news groups data. And we are trying to see if we can categorize them back into their, uh, their specific subgroups. And we want to basically convert this into a bag of words method to be our features. So this part's the feature extraction where we are trying to grab uh, a feature by document matrix. So to do that, we take our blank model, our count vectorizer, and fit transform, which takes our training corpus and turns it into that terms by document matrix. Okay. Now, um, use fit transform the first time on the training data, and it should be a stringed NumPy array. Then we'll also take this and apply the same feature processing uh, set to our test data, but instead of fit transform, it's just transform. Why? So in fit transform, it's creating the vocabulary and then calculating it for each document. In transform, it takes the original vocabulary and applies it to the document. So any new words that are in the test corpus that did not appear in the training corpus are ignored because otherwise it doesn't know what to do with them because your model didn't have them in originally. So there's no weight or no prediction for those because they didn't see them before. So you wanna make sure that your trust corpus and your training corpus are really pretty equivalent or at least randomly selected so that the features that get left out because they're not in the test corpus are um, maybe just as informative as something that stayed in. And that's one reason why you bias, also bias the data towards the training corpus because you want your model to see all of the different examples. Now notice this is a sparse array, sparse matrix. So that's good. And then here we just printed out the sizes of them. So we have, um, we have here, uh, this is 14,000 documents and this is 71,000 words in our vocabulary. Our test feature has 3,700 documents, but then also the same 71,000 features. So we want our training and our test to have the same feature set so that we can uh, examine how well our prediction is on a new data set. Because it cannot predict from things it's never seen before. It can predict to new things, new documents, but it can't predict with words that it has never seen. So that's our feature extraction. Which if we look at, go back here and look at our, our model, what we've done, we've normalized the text. We did that last week. Right now we've taken that and done feature extraction and created these training features. The next component is building a supervised machine learning algorithm. So we're gonna do three examples. The first of which is logistic regression. So logistic regression is very popular. I mean, I use it more of a statistic, but it's a very popular classification. Um, algorithm because it tends to work pretty well. And the idea here is that you are classifying between discrete outcomes. So binary logistic regression helps classify between two discrete outcomes. 
Multinomial logistic regression classifies between multiple outcomes, but it does it in a binary way. So a multinomial um, analysis does this versus that, this is versus the other, so one versus two, one versus three, or there are other options, but that's the general rule. Okay. Now, what it does is it transform a linear model, right? So a straight prediction between group one and group two into uh, the logit here, where we get a better um, representation or better fit to the, to the data because we are fitting essentially all the group down here and all the group up here. And it reduces the residuals because that pattern, this S curve here, best represents the data. Okay. So each class of, uh, category gets a probability score right, of their likelihood of being group one, essentially. So if their probability score is zero, that means they're not very likely to be group one. They're probably going to be group zero. If their probability score outcome is uh, 0.95, they're up here and they're merely likely to be group one. You know, if you have a probability score 50-50, you have no idea what group they're supposed to be in. <laughs> and so what happens is that each predicted score ends up being a probability value. But we take that probability value and convert it into a category, basically by splitting in half. So if you're at you know, 50.01, you go into group one. If you're at you know, less than 50, 49.99999, you go into group zero. And so that allows us to, to um, recapture the, bi the, not binary, but the categorical outcome. So let's look at that, how to do that in Python. Okay, we're gonna use scikit-learn for almost all of this today, but we're gonna import our, our model. It's the same set of steps, import our model. We're also gonna import this really pretty classification report so that we can look at accuracy, precision, and recall, build a blank model. Okay, and I've kind of done some basic defaults here where we've got an L2 penalization, a multi-class problem solver, and we've definitely turned on multi-class. Okay, these are actually most of the defaults. Max iterations, which you can increase if you have problems getting your model to converge. C is one of the, uh, is, is usually one. And a good Hitchhiker's check our sky to the galaxy joke where our random state's 42. Okay. So the rules are the same, load it up, blank, build a blank model, fit it to the data. So this is just dot fit. You put in your X values. Our X values are all our training feature set that we extracted using our bag of words method. And then your Y values, which are our label names. So what we're trying to classify. Once you fit the data, then you have to examine model performance. So nothing exciting really happens. It just says, okay, I fit the data. What do you want now? <laughs> so then what you do is you say, okay, well, can I predict new data from my fitted model? So you do dot predict on your test features. Make sure this is training up here, test down here. And you only put an X because you are predicting our Y. So we only put an X because we're predicting Y. And to know how well that model did, I print my classification report. Okay, use the print command specifically, otherwise this does not print pretty. It prints kind of ugly. So print the classification report. Okay. And so we do test label names from here, comma Y predicted. So here's the actual names. Here's what I predicted. How well did I do? And the cool thing about this report is it gives you uh, accuracy, precision, and recall for each category, which is how that works. Okay, you don't just do them overall, um, and then gives you a, a macro accuracy of like everything taken together. Okay, so we're getting about seventy percent correct, which I know many people are like it's ninety-five or bust, but that is not an accurate representation of reality. What you want to think about when you're assessing your scores here is how, what is chance? Okay, I think I have like 20 groups. Maybe that's why it's called 20 news groups. Um, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay, so we have 20 news groups. So chance is one in 20. We're doing a lot better than one in 20. Very cool. 
And then I have to think about um, within each group. So you want to have an overall good accuracy score, but then you don't want to have a really good accuracy score and one group is never predicted correctly, okay? especially if you only have two. And so I used to have this assignment that I would give students where they would tell me that their model was really good because the accuracy was like 70% or 80%, but they never got group two right. So a model that does not accurately predict one of the groups is not a good model, okay? You want to be able to predict all of your category labels. And you'll probably get a varying range of prediction ability, but a model that can never predict one of the category labels, like you either got to take that out or do something better. And if we examine these kind of overall, right, what we can tell is that we're not doing that great at miscellaneous religion. And overall, we do tend to do worse in the religion categories. There are some of the lower ones. We're doing a little bit better in some of our sports categories, but overall religion tends to be the lower one. But all of them are, can be at least predicted somewhat with this religious one being the lowest. So no zeros at least. Now I can manipulate the feature extractor, which we'll do in a second, or I can manipulate the algorithm. So right now we're gonna manipulate the algorithm and in a second we're gonna manipulate the feature extractor. So let's see if Naive Bayes can be any better as an algorithm. So Naive Bayes calculates the prior probability of each category, because that's fairly important. If one group is more likely, then your guess should be biased towards that group because it's just more likely to happen. And so we can see the probability of the label here. This is an example from the NLTK book. So these are based on their example, but we would have the probability of each of our 20 news groups. Then the contribution of each feature, which remember is each word in this case, is added to that category prediction. So the probability of feature one given the label. And so, you know, if I'm talking about sports, it's more likely to be a sports category. So sports related words give it more weight towards sports. Whereas, um, you know, crime related words give it more weight towards murder mysteries in this example. Okay, so for each feature, its predictiveness is added to that category. And then you sum the likelihood of all of those categories across all of those features and come up with the posterior distribution, which is the likelihood of the label given all of the features. So for each document, what is the likelihood of it being sports given I have seen this pattern of features? And the highest one wins. So in a multi-class situation, whichever probability is the highest is the one that gets selected. So we're going to do multi-nomial naive Bayes in Python. And you just import, and import that. Build yourself a blank model. Okay, so all this should look familiar. It's the same pattern each time. Fit our training features and training names to it. Predict our test features and run a classification report on that test feature prediction. Overall, Naive Bayes, you know, 74-ish percent to 71%, depending on which one you want to look at. So it's a little bit better than our logistic regression model, but not much. I can see what happened here to my F1 scores or any of the other scores, but I'm actually really doing quite bad at the religion category now. So overall, some of them pushed up, but this particular category is actually really bad because 10% accuracy is not very good. So maybe a slight bias towards that first model because it more evenly predicts each category correctly. Let's try one more. And let's do linear support vector machines or machine singular, okay? That is an algorithm that allows us to separate categories by examining the hyperplane. So in multidimensional data space, what is the, the ability of us separating? Where is the line that separates all of class one to class two? And what we see, uh, like if I look at my stars and my triangles here, that this black line is the best one that separates them very cleanly into stars and triangles. The orange line, not so much. 
and the blue line not so much. So we want to find the spot where that black line is. And it gives a weight for each feature. And so support vectors are those data points for the features that are closest to our final hyper, hyperplane. So here is our great prediction split. And the things that help us predict are the ones that are very close because those are the ones that are hardest to distinguish. And so we calculate a model that looks at where they are in relation to those points and helps use that to figure out, are they above or below the hyperplane? And so a hyperplane here is just a decision plane, a place at which on this side it's stars and on that side it's triangles. So importing linear SVC, it has very similar arguments to logistic regression, L2 penalty, C1, blah, blah, blah. I had to turn up the iterations on this to get it to converge. That's not that unusual. So don't take, you know, don't think that that's too crazy. Fit my training data to it. Okay. And it actually still failed to converge. Lib linear failed to converge. So I should go back and rerun this with more iterations. Uh, what else I got? I'm predicting it and printing a classification report. And so what we see is the SVC model, support vector machines, SVM, it's SVC up here, uh, is worse than the first two. Okay, our overall accuracy is lower, although the, the, the F1 scores represent that the, the accuracy is more evenly spread between groups. So if this is all I looked at, I'd probably pick the logistic regression model because while it predicts slightly less than the naive Bayes model, it at least predicts each category somewhat versus the naive Bayes model, which predicts a little better, but some of those categories are really bad. Well, what if instead I decide to manipulate the feature test set? So we've manipulated the algorithms. We can also manipulate the feature test set. So quick with the results. They give us approximately the same results. Um, accuracy is about 70%, which is pretty good. I would say that um, logistic regression and naive Bayes are more equal, and then SVM is the lowest here. Okay. But maybe, maybe a bag of words method is not the best approach. So let's try a TF-IDF transform on our bag of words. So remember that TF-IDF is a weighting scheme it's not really a whole new feature extraction method. You take a count vectorized model and convert it to a weighted matrix. And so it lessens the importance of very frequent terms and creates, uh, can elevate salient infrequent words, but generally lessens these infrequent words because they're not very distinguishing. Now we'll warn you here, we're using scikit-learn. There is a big argument over the TF-IDF math in scikit-learn. There's a huge GitHub page on it about how some people do not think that they are doing the right type of math for their TF-IDF formula here. So it is not the traditional one. It is a special flavor of TF-IDF. And um, if these things are important to you, you can check out their GitHub. But I do like to warn folks that it is not um, the default formula that you might find if you just Google the TF-IDF. The argument is over where they're adding one to the denominator because you cannot divide by a zero frequency. So just a warning, it does tend to work pretty well. Um, you can also use Gensum to, to transform this data and we'll do that in a different lecture. Since it's the same package though as the count vectorizer, the arguments are basically the same. So we import TF-IDF, use IDF equals true. That means actually do the stupid transform on it. Minimum DF, maximum DF, we've already talked about. Cool. Now uh, we have to fit our features to it. This is their blank model, TV fit transform on a train corpus, and then TV transform on a test corpus. Do notice it looks all the same. It should because it's the count vectorized model transformed mathematically. So if those two things don't look the same, something's wrong. Now I'm gonna do the exact same thing again, but don't forget that when you change feature types, don't just fit the model, re 
restart your model. Because when you just fit the model, you're fitting new data to an already fitted model. And sometimes that erases the original model and sometimes it updates the model depending on what package you're using. So it's better to just recreate yourself a blank model, just to be sure. Because we don't want to update the old one, we want to run a whole new one. But it's basically the same. I've used the same setup here. I haven't manipulated any of this particular set of, of um, algorithm options. And let's run exactly the same output and see what we get. So by transforming our sparse matrix into weights over counts, we get a 4% increase in accuracy, which is kind of a lot. That's a, like a big difference when you think about there are 20 categories. Now, unfortunately, that what that seems to do is push data towards precision and lessens recall. So on average, they're about the same, maybe a little higher, but on some of the categories, they go lower. So this is lower than before, but it's not zero at least. Let's try multinomial base, same out, same, same everything here. And it pushes it up to overall accuracy 71%. And again, we are just, we're doing really bad at this religion miscellaneous category. So what that seems, what multinomial base seems to do is it tends to push up some of these very distinguishing PC ones and sports ones, but tends to push down some of the politics and religion ones. So the model's not very good for those. Last but not least, uh, support vector machines. And surprise, this one is the best. So it's 76% accurate. And one of the highest set of F1 scores for all of our categories with a more even split between them. So this one's still the lowest, but that's actually the highest number we found so far. And so this is really is something I like to use to highlight, I hate the question, which one is best? I'm like, I don't know, try it, right? Because you're never quite sure until you run the models, which combinations will work best. I tend to like TF-IDF personally, but with logistic regression, I don't know that I would have predicted the support vector machines would have worked best in this combination. So it'll depend on the data and what, what is in the data because these different algorithms can capitalize on different components to the data that you have available. So there's never an answer to which one is best. There are ones that work better than others, but just try them. Just run them and see and pick the best model that you get. Okay, that's the good thing about this not being re regular traditional statistics is in statistics, if I told you that I would get shunned in, in machine learning, try them all, pick the best one. Okay. Now, one thing you can do to investigate a model that is not performing up to what you would like is, is figure out where you are incorrect. So we can make that confusion matrix like we talked about before, which is a matrix of the, the guessed answers to the actual answers and um, examine if you get it wrong, where do they go? Okay, now we'll note that printing out a straight confusion matrix can be a little confusing um, especially because it does not print very well, uh, but you can print it out as an array. Instead, I really like this plot confusion matrix function. I'm gonna put in my best model, which was our second SVM model, our test features, our test label names, and then plot sideways so that we can see them. Um, Oh, it looks like they're getting rid of confusion matrix, plot confusion matrix, which is no fun because I had to upgrade scikit-learn a couple of semesters ago to even get to see this message. Uh, and, but display from estimator. So it's telling me here where it's going. So we can update these notes to include um, from predictions or from estimator. In our case, we would do from estimator, right? So from the model, here are our test features, here are our test label names, give it to me. So you would change confusion matrix, metrics dot confusion matrix, blah, blah, blah. But either way, it's a really great plot. So however we have to get it, um, the plot is really nice 
because it's much more visual, I can see where the data went. So down here, especially, these are mostly the religious categories. So here's Christian. Okay, this is guns in the Middle East, but here's um, our atheism one, right? And so you can tell by looking at the big numbers that if I missed Christian, it went into religious miscellaneous. So at least I'm getting it close, right? And if I missed atheism, it's going into Christian okay, or religious miscellaneous. So that's what you would like to see out of your model. If you're gonna get it wrong, getting it wrong in something that's already conceptually very similar is good because at least I'm getting the religious ones right. I'm not sticking them into auto categories or baseball, although that's a different religion, right? I'm at least getting them right in the right, wrong in the right way. So I could decide since my religious ones are very hard to predict to collapse and just make a religion category, or I could pull those out into their own model to see if I can find a, something that's more distinguishing. And we can do that for each kind of cluster of categories. So I see there's a little cluster here. And so if I'm getting a PC one or a computational one wrong, they're going into the other category. So it's going from PC to Mac, for example. And that makes sense. So, you know, a lot of these out here, the, they, they're really wrong in a way that makes no sense, but all of the bigger numbers here are wrong in a way that makes sense. Okay. Now, that's our second feature extraction. We're gonna try something different. So back and forth method and a TF IDF are basically the same type of feature explain explainer, right? They're both words by documents and the internal mechanism of the number is what's different. WordNet, however, is a completely kind of different focus. And what it does is it extends this bag of words model into a simple neural net. So WordNet and some of its friends like fast text are simple neural nets where, um, I'm not WordNet, that's a totally different thing, word to vec and fast text and glove, I think also falls into this category are simple neural nets where there's one layer of inputs, a hidden layer and one layer of outputs. Deep learning models have multiple hidden layers. Okay? And neural nets are trying to represent the way that the brain actually works because we have input systems like our eyes and our ears and our nose and our skin. And then we have output systems, same idea. And Everything in the middle is sort of this, what's called a hidden layer. Because we don't really know what this neuron is doing. Okay, we know there are certain parts of the brain that control things, like uh, vision is in the back here. And neural net computational models are meant to kind of capture this. There's some magic that goes on in the middle here. And these hidden layers, something is happening, and we're just going to let the data tell us what it is. So they're organized into layers, which show these like interconnected processes that occur during cognitive, during thinking, cognition, um, vision, that kind of stuff. And the nodes are connected. So in our case, our nodes are our features. They're connected to these hidden features by a weights. And a model is trained and it updates those weights. So it sees a pass of the data and it changes the weights, get another pass, and changes the weights until the model settles. So here is an, a not a linguistic example, but I just kind of Googled like simple neural net. And so this one is actually trying to predict what type of drug one would use in a medical situation where we have our sodium to potassium, blood pressure, age, cholesterol, and gender. And so the input layer here would be the type of person it is. There's a hidden layer, so this is a fully connected model, where the hidden layer is like, the, you don't have labels for those nodes, they're just doing whatever they're doing. And the weights here change based on the pattern of inputs, and the pattern of inputs will then lead to a specific prediction. So it's kind of like, when you can apply this to words, it's kind of like if it has this word and this word and this word, it's category one. But if it has these six words, it's probably category two. Now, the way that word to vec converts text 
into tensors basically, but um, you know, node representation can be manipulated. So there's two main components to this. Fast text is the kind of also can do both of these. And then there's newer forms of the skip gram model here, but it, all of them, all the different versions of this kind of collapse down into these two basic ideas. The first one here on the left is called a SIBO or continuous bag of words method, where what happens is there's a, a average relationship of the entire input to the output. So much like reading, what you get a window of words. So I'm trying to predict the word fine here. So what I have, I'm, fine, I'm selling these fine leather jackets. So to predict the word fine, I have the window of words around it, selling these fine leather jackets. And from that, I take the average of the words around it, and that will lead me to my prediction of the word fine. Okay, so instead of being a one-to-one -one relationship of selling to fine and these to fine, it's sort of the average pattern of events. And this is meant to encode context because I, I'm pretty sure I said, but if I didn't, the biggest complaint of a bag of words methods is that it loses context. So you just don't keep the word order at all. You take it and shake it up, right? Here, we are embedding context in word order. And that average context or that gist representation is what predicts the, the output. In a skip gram version of the model, it still has context, but instead of averaging over those contexts, there's a direct relationship between each individual word and its predicted output. Okay. So we're predicting selling fine from selling and these and leather and jackets. So it creates this direct relationship between the co-occurrence of the words in the window to the output. Now notice here that the output is not our category label. Word to vec really wasn't designed to predict, um, you know, kind of specific category outputs. It's actually designed to embed the context of, of documents. But what we can do is take the um, matrix of these embeddings out of the word to vec model and use it as our feature table. So instead of having words by documents, as our feature extraction that we use then to predict, we have a sort of context by documents and these like average contexts of these situations to see if that then predicts the category label. Internally, what word to vec models do is they predict the next, the word in the window. So they're actually really good at predicting context. But if we extract all that information from our model, we can use it in our traditional machine learning way. So let's look at how to do that. It's uh, not pretty, but we can do it. So one thing about Word2Vec is that it needs to have the data tokenized to build a model. OK, fine. So for, um, for each text in our corpus, uh, Word tokenize it. So I'm using NLTK to just break this apart. And so I have a tokenized train, a list of lists of all the words, and our tokenized test data set as well. So just make sure you tokenize them in the same way. Now we're going to use the Gensum library, which is one of my favorites in Python, to build a word to vec model. It will also do fast text, topics modeling, and LSA, and other stuff I'm not aware of, I'm sure. Pick a minimum number of features. This is the, uh, um, the number of nodes in the hidden layer. Why 300? Why not? So there's some research on um, on the best representation of language in these models. And 300 seem to work pretty well. So I just pick 300 somewhat arbitrarily. You can turn this up, turn it down and see which way your model goes. If it makes it better to have more features or less features. And remember these features are gonna get averaged into context and we'll use that to predict our documents. So to build our model, we do gensum.models.wordsvec. You put in your tokenized corpus, or words, how many features you'd like to have, the size of the moving window, how many words around each one. So this is 10 words in the front and 10 words in the back. So that's a 20 word window. 
the minimum number of times that this is not correct, but the minimum count that a word has to occur to be included in the model. So here we're saying the word has to be seen at least twice to be included in the context embeddings, because if it only occurs once, it's hard to predict. Skipgram equals zero is a continuous bag of words model. Skipgram equals one means it's a skipgram model. Now this nastiness, and I will tell you I took it from the book, but what it does is it takes our built word to vec model, which is meant to predict context, and um, takes the context arrays and sort of averages them um, down so that we have these sort of average context across documents. Uh, and what we end up with is this sort of average context dimensionality, so of 300 features to predict from, to our documents. Okay, because we did a 300 feature model. If we have 1500 features in our, in our words of vec, then we'd have 1500 contexts or average contexts um, to predict from. So we're, we're essentially reducing this much like factor analysis, taking that dimensionality and reducing it down. Um, and so it stops being about word counts and starts being about these sort of um, gist representations, or if you're familiar with topic model, these kind of themes, these um, topics that are represented in the text. And that's what all this nastiness does. So this is a function here that grabs the vocabulary, the words that are there. And for each word, it sort of creates this average, um, average context that is embedded for that word, and then um, creates these average word vectors for us. So this is the function. You can put it at the top of your, uh, your processing. And then here's us running that on the um, training features and the test features. So we essentially built the word to vec model to extract these features from it. Naturally, by themselves, word to vec models don't predict categorical outcomes like this. Okay, We are just using it as a feature extraction method. And then we do the exact same math, really, like the hard part's getting it into the right feature structure format. But let's try logistic regression. Oh man, it is bad. It is really bad. <laughs> so 50% on its own was actually not terrible because we have 20 categories, but we already know we were hitting 70% before. So embedding word context is not helping us any, especially in this religion category. We didn't get a single one right. This is not a good model when you do not get a single one of one of the categories right. Okay, that's a bad model. Don't do that. Okay. Or if you do that, don't say the model's good. <laughs> so maybe not logistic regression. Let's look at Bayes here. And here's where a problem we're gonna run into. Here's a, an issue you're gonna run into using Bayes. If your feature extraction includes negative numbers, Bayes don't do it, okay? because Bayes in this, in this scenario does not allow negative numbers. So what can you do? Well, you still want to use word to vec, right? Well, we can maintain the relationship between the columns and rows by simply adding a constant that brings everything above zero. Okay. So in this case, I see that if I add three to everything, basically, I can um, put all of them above zero, but that maintains the correlation structure and all the other um, relationships between the text. So adding a, 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 a doing a linear transform or adding a linear co a constant here does not screw up our matrix or our models. It just makes this run. I added four because at one point when I ran this, it was like 3.2, <laughs> but looking at it now, I could have added three to all of these. But again, adding the constant it doesn't matter if it's three or four, really. Okay. So I've brought them all above zero, and now I'm going to run my regular model. And it's still really bad. It's even worse. Okay, we're only getting a third of them right. And we're really not getting any of the religion or politics ones right. Okay. So adding those contexts is not really helping us. And it does give us the warning here. When you have a zero here, it will warn you because it is divided by zero. Maybe SVM? No, not really. Okay. So this one actually failed to converge as well. I should increase the max iterations. 
but I think you can tell right away that this model is also not good, okay? especially in these last two categories. So while word to vec can be very predictive for things, it is a very popular model. It can work really well. In this scenario with this data set, it does not work very well. So you really have to pay attention to the type of extraction and the algorithm. And within the algorithm, there are probably pieces and components to tweak. So I've written word to vec off, but if maybe if I increased it to a thousand features, it would work better. Because in my first set of models, I predicted from 71,000 features. Well, no crap, it's going to be better, right? Because I just have more things I'm predicting from, because my features were the vocabulary. In a word to vec model, maybe that is too much dimension reduction. Maybe. So I can go back, increase my number to like 800 and see what happens. So there are a lot of places to slowly tweak. If it doesn't get a whole lot better, I'd still ditch it. And you could also try a skip gram model. So there are many places to kind of work on hyper tuning or tuning a model to see if it runs better, especially if they don't take that long to run. There's, you know, if there's not a penal, a time penalty to running a bunch of different models, because we just ran nine in this lecture and they took, you know, five, 10 minutes. So I could use that to go, okay, log is my, um, sorry, SVM with the TF-IDF is my best model. Okay. So let's summarize all this up and then move on to sentiment next week. So we examine different options for classification, focusing on the feature representation for words, then focusing on algorithm. Actually, we did it the other way. So we looked at the three different algorithms and the three different ways to represent words as text. We find that the features have an impact on the outcome as well as the algorithm. So a different combination of features and algorithms give us different answers. So when you ask me which one's best, there's my answer. I don't know, try them all. Okay. And then we also talk very briefly about like, what's the idea of a word to vec model. In my other course that I teach the human language modeling, we go way more into way more detail about how word to vec works and what it's for and its purposes. Um, which you can also find on YouTube if you're just watching this for fun. Uh, but in this scenario, just kind of very briefly, we talked about what a simple neural net model is and um, how we can leverage word to vex context embedding to see if context would help us in prediction. In this case, no. I have done other projects where it made leaps and bounds of a difference. So again, really understanding your data and the combination of data and algorithm is super important because they will be different, their predictions. Here, we don't see too big of a difference between bag of words and TF-IDF, but there's a big, big difference between word to vec. Right. So we're gonna take all of these ideas and apply them next week to sentiment. First, we'll actually do sentiment on um, unsupervised classification. So how can we do this if we don't have the answers? And then building sentiment models with cl uh, supervised classification, much like we just did here.